It works on my machine. Isn't that a phrase you like to hear? Whether the code did actually work on your machine or someone was stalling for a bug they were supposed to fix last week, the phrase it works on my machine is never really a great one to hear. And honestly, this problem is far too common in the tech industry to have no solution. Luckily, containers exist, which allow us to run code in a portable, isolated environment. Now, if that made no sense to you, don't worry, you're not alone. I also have no idea what I just said. I'm joking. Uh, obviously. Developing on containers allows you to run code whenever and wherever you want, regardless of your host operating system. Moreover, it bundles all the dependencies and tools needed to run some code, allowing it to be run on any computer, anywhere. Think of a container as a box, where you can place an operating system, compilers for the code, the code itself, and any other tools you would need inside the box. Once you're done creating this one box, you can now create as many boxes as you would want and ship it wherever you want, as the template has already been defined. You might think a container is just the same thing as a VM, and thank god it's not. The pain of taking an hour to set up a VM just for it to run at 15 frames per second and then crash is honestly something else. Alright, VMs aren't that bad, but you get the point. No matter how you piece it, a virtual machine is in general sluggish and slow, especially in comparison to containers. And don't get me wrong, virtual machines do have their place, but we don't need to talk about that in this video. One of the main differences between containers and VMs is how and what they virtualize. Virtualization is essentially allocating resources such as RAM, networking, and CPUs into multiple virtualized resources. A virtual machine will virtualize all the layers, including the hardware layers. They do this using a tool called the hypervisor, which allows the virtual machine to access physical components like the CPU. On the other hand, containers only virtualize the software layer from the operating system and above. Since containers don't have to virtualize the hardware, they're super fast and great in situations where portability is really important. Anytime you're working on a project that could be run on someone else's system is a time where you should use containers. Imagine a situation where you spent months on a project. As the time comes around to deploy and release the product, you come across an unfortunate realization. Your code only works on your machine. When developing on a container, this problem won't happen anymore, and you can just ship out the container. Containers can also allow for quick horizontal scaling of your project. Additionally, it's extremely fast to simulate production environments when you need multiple different tools for a certain task. Say you need a database and a web server for a project. Using containers, you can quickly have an environment with these tools, and when you're done with them, you can just shut off the container without ever having to congest your local environment with a whole bunch of packages. The biggest provider for containers are Docker containers, and they make it super easy to set up a container. To get started, you need to create a Docker file, which will instruct Docker on how to create the image. You can also create images using the command line, but Docker files are far more efficient. The syntax to create a basic Docker container takes no time to learn. I'll showcase it by making a simple Node.js server, which returns a hello world message. Real original, I know. If you want the code, I've attached a link to the GitHub below. In order to create your own images, in traditional software engineering fashion, we need a copy from others. Or more nicely put, we're just going to use a base image. We do that with the from keyword, where we can specify the base image we want to pull it from, and its version. In this case, we're just going to use the node 22 image. But depending on your needs, you can use another language as an image, or an entire OS like Ubuntu as the base image. The node 22 image specifies that we're going to be using Node, but more specifically, the 22nd version. We can use the latest version, but it's typically a good practice to specify a version to ensure compatibility with tools and packages. The second step is to specify a working directory. The working directory is where the Docker container considers its home or root directory. Every subsequent command will be run from this location. We'll set the working directory to be at slash app. Then, we can copy over the package.json file to the slash app working directory. This file in particular is important as it stores the metadata and the other important information regarding a JavaScript project. Next, we run npm install, installing all the packages, and then copy them to the container with another copy command. Additionally, to ensure we don't recopy the node modules, we can create a docker ignore file, which works in a similar fashion to git ignore. Having two copy steps may seem redundant, but we'll get to that in a second. In the penultimate instruction, we'll expose port 8000. This is the port that the node app is running on. Exposing a port tells the container to listen in on port 8000. Finally, 
we have the command instruction, which is the default command to run when the container is built. Although it looks like the run instruction, each Docker image can only have one command instruction. The command npm run dev starts the development server. Each of these instructions is then converted into a layer, which can be cached. When a Docker file is rebuilt, Docker reuses the cached layers to speed up build times. Along the same vein are the copy statements. Copying the package.json and running npm install ensures that we do not reinstall all the packages, unless the package.json changes. It's an extremely useful feature and saves a lot of time when you consistently have to rebuild images. To convert the Docker file into an image, we run docker build. And to run the image, we use the command docker run. Here, we use the image name, but we can also use the image ID instead. The dash p flag is used for port forwarding. Remember how we exposed port 8000 in the docker file? The flag tells docker to map the local port 8001 to the containers 8000. Additionally, if you ever have multiple images, there's a tool called docker compose, which can help run all of your docker images at once, unless you get paid by the hour. Then go ahead, take your time, and manually run each image. Now, to see this in action, we can navigate to localhost at port 8001. And there we go. Now we have the most boring message in code, which is hello world. Well, that's Docker in a nutshell. Now don't get too excited, because then you'll have to deal with Kubernetes. And well, that's just a topic for a different video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys later.